Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com. You know, I, one of you, somebody, I don't know, recently sent in a comment that said that you know, even the best sounding recording is somehow artificial because it doesn't really seem equivalent to live. And so it must have been somehow electronically manipulated. I didn't respond to it. I just deleted it. I mean, because life is too short. Besides, I figured I could respond to it in a way this way. I just want to make something clear. A recording, in case you haven't noticed, isn't a live performance. Even a recording of a live performance isn't a live performance. A recording is something else entirely. It's made to be used and experienced in the home or on your little eye bloopies or whatever they're called, or in the bathroom or, you know, wherever you want to be or on your headphones. I think the idea of replicating a live experience, while laudable in theory, is rather silly in practice because the fact of the matter is they're not going to fool anybody. You always know that you are not, in fact, having a live experience, don't you? At least I have no problem telling the two different experiences apart. And, and all I am interested in in a recording is something that lets me experience the music in its own way, but a valid way, a legitimate way, a way that does the work being recorded justice. And that means dynamic range, clarity, timbre, all of the things that happen in a live performance or should in a good live performance should also happen in a recording. And when that happens, I'm thrilled with the recording. It's that simple. But I don't think that the goal of recording is to substitute for the live experience of music. Nothing substitutes for that and nothing ever will. So why do we waste time talking about it or taking otherwise excellent sounding recordings to task because they don't completely, utterly, authentically replicate what you would hear if you were in a concert hall? I mean, if that's what you want to hear, you go to a concert hall. If you don't want to hear that, or if you still want to hear the music, you're going to hear it not in a concert hall. You're going to hear it wherever you hear it. And so you have to put up with it that way. And I think they're two completely different experiences, totally different experiences. And so I don't get bothered by this idea of whether something's live or whether it's recorded. And, and underneath all of this sort of thing, the subtext is that recording is somehow artificial or mechanical or cold or dehumanizing or, you know, and I think that is just horseshit. I really do. I mean, if that's how you experience it, that's your problem. I don't have that problem. Most of you don't have that problem. So, so why tell us what your problem is? Go to a therapist. Go deal with your problem. Don't bother the rest of us with it. That's how I feel about that angle. But that aspect of it, that aspect of recordings being somehow, you know, anti-musical and even worse because you sell them for like money, filthy lucre. You know, that means that there's also the capitalistic commercial side of it that just freaks people out, especially certain left-wing Europeans who have commented here. And I just can't get over the fact that we are still having discussions about capitalism versus other forms of economic whatever. I mean, in this day and age, yeah, I, I, those also I delete. <laughs> you know, if you if you if you want your comment deleted, I'm telling you right now, try not talking about music, but instead write some indictment of the capitalist system. It's not because I love capitalism. It's because we are here to talk about music. Don't give me this nonsense about uh, your silly economic theories. It's just so funny to see that. But th let's get to the point, shall we? The point is this. The point is that we find, most particularly in evaluating conductors, some who are more comfortable in the studio than others, or some who profess not to like recording. And it's a very interesting phenomenon when you think about it. I want you to really give it some thought. I mean, let's examine this because it's not an issue that we usually have with singers, for example. I mean, there are some singers whose voices don't record terribly well, but it's not because they can't sing or because their singing is so unbelievably different 
when they're live or when they're in a studio. And it's mostly true of instrumentalists too. And I was thinking about it and it occurs to me that, for example, you don't see string quartets saying, oh my God, we can't make recordings. <laughs> we can only play in front of a huge audience. I mean, it's a string quartet, right? Because chamber music and solo piano music, solo music of various kinds, it's, it's music for the musicians. It's musicians making music amongst themselves especially in chamber music ensembles. And so the presence or absence of the audience, I think is much less a consideration than it is with a conductor who lives to perform in front of an audience. In fact, you know, I mean, that's what they do. And so, you know, when a string quartet plays, and I know this from my friends who play in chamber ensembles, I mean, they can play in their living room, in rooms that are completely unsuited to the timbre of the instruments, and, you know, the, the size of the sound they make, and it doesn't make any difference because they're playing for each other. And so the intimacy and spontaneity of the performance can happen anywhere. It may happen in front of an audience or it may not. It may just as easily happen in the studio. And that's true of solo pianists and lots of people. I mean, there, of course, there are always some. There are always some who don't like to make records and who, you know, make an issue about it. Maybe for some of them, it's true. And then you get some like Glenn Gould, who hated performing in front of an audience. You know, everybody has their quirks, but I'm talking about it as a sort of a general proposition. Conductors have this issue. And what I find even stranger is the idea that we somehow admire the ones who won't make recordings as though they're somehow nobler than the ones who do make recordings. When in fact, it, that has no, no aesthetic or artistic value whatsoever. It's just a quirk, it's a preference, it's a personality trait, but it doesn't make, it doesn't make them better because they don't like recording. I mean, we were hearing it now from, 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 you know, what's his name? Kirill Petrenko of the Berlin Philharmonic. And of course, there was Celebedaki and there was Fort Wengler and Knoppert's Bush. And it's, you know, all these people who are against modern life, against technology. And so they, they allied this, this, this anti-modernist prejudice to their own, frankly, incompetence. Because that's all it is. It's, it's incompetence. It's, it's the inability to perform under certain circumstances. And of course, if you really feel that strongly about making records, don't. I mean, you know, the world isn't going to miss any of it. I mean, really not. I, I can assure them of that. But I decided for this chat that I wanted to make a little list of conductors who were every bit as good in the studio as they were alive, if not better in the studio than they were alive, because most conductors don't have an issue with it. And I think we also need to understand that when we say in the studio, it's not a studio. I mean, it can be a studio. You can go to like Abbey Road Studios, a big room there and do something, you know, and film soundtracks and things are done on sound stages and things. I mean, that you can do. But most of the time you're talking about a concert hall, an assembly hall, a giant public space where they just take the chairs out or there's no audience. But otherwise, it's the same thing. It's basically the same event. So, there, you know, if you're a conductor if, or, who absolutely has to have an audience breathing down your back in order to get your, your interpretive juices flowing, fine and fine and good. You may have a fabulous career as such, but I will say you are compromised as a musician because a musician should be able to play music. You know, so long as, so long as the, the instrument is there, in this case, the orchestra, you should be able to do just as well. And so here is my list of 20 in this case. I'm not doing 10. I'm not doing, you know, 12 and a third. 20 conductors whose records are fabulous, whether they're live or in the studio. And they had no problem distinguishing between the two, and they had no problem performing equally well under both circumstances. And I just, I just think that that's what great artists should be able to do. I really believe that. I, I don't buy these excuses about how there's something, something evil about technology. It's like, ooh, no. It's, it's pathetic is what that is. It's just a pathetic excuse. So let's start. Georg Schulte. Number one, Schulte, you know, is an interesting case because his career was made by recordings. I mean, it was made by the fact that he did the ring. I mean, he did other things too, of course, but that is what put him on the map and it put him on the map as an opera conductor and it had, had it not been for recording, 
um, I don't believe he would have had anything like the career he really he eventually had. And what's even more interesting is that I saw him many, many times live. And the fact of the matter is that live he was he was rather inconsistent. I mean, technically inconsistent. I mean, I'll never forget, and some of you were probably there too, that fabulous performance of the Rite of Spring where half the orchestra went left and the other half went right in part one and Schulte just sat there and turned pages and had no idea what to do with all. So finally, somewhere down the road, they coalesced and and the performance went on. And I, I've seen a bunch of things like that in his performances and his live recordings. There's another one. Actually, it's the Rite of Spring too. Um, with the Concertgebouw, that live one, it's just terribly played in some, some places. He had real issues sometimes keeping things together, but not on recordings. He was a the recording artist par excellence as a conductor. And that, I mean, he was the Grammy champion. That's what made his career was his ability to perform in the studio just as well, if not better, than he did live. A slightly different case is Colin Davis. Colin Davis was just as good in the studio as, as he was live or just as bad. I, that is the interesting thing about Colin Davis. He was so unpredictable. You, you never knew what you were going to get. And it might be great in either place, but there isn't any one place where the greatness was more manifest than any other. Because I saw him, again, I saw him many times live, and, and you know, particularly with the Boston Symphony, but also with the New York Philharmonic. And, you know, it's really, it's really very, very funny because usually you could count on him to make one major mistake in every performance. I mean, I, major mistake, I mean, you know, just some sort of ensemble lapse or something. Then he'd get it together. And of course, you don't hear that on the recordings. And he could be very, very spontaneous and impulsive on recordings, just as he was live. He made no distinction between recording and live. And I think that's what it has to be. You have to just love music so much that you're always going to do your best whenever you encounter it. And that's what the great conductors did. Number three on my list is Eugene Ormandy. Eugene Ormandy was so good at making records that everybody took him for granted. There was absolutely no difference between what he did live and on records. He, he had a, a standard of performance which was so high and so immediately identifiable that, I mean, they could have been playing underwater or, you know, upside down or sideways. Or it, it, it just wouldn't have mattered. You got Ormandy in Philadelphia. And I think that's one of the reasons that he was taken for granted because he was so reliable, just so bloody reliable. That doesn't mean he didn't make some lousy records. Of course he did. But by and large, they weren't lousier because they were records. He just produced like he was absolutely Mr. Reliable. And, and that counts against you in the world of the arts because, of course, we value artists that are, that are dangerous, that are unpredictable, that are a little wild or crazy. We somehow find that, you know, more, more appealing in a way. And, um, you know, I'm not one of those people either. I don't, I don't think that's true. I think it's our, our duty, if we love what, what this is, to recognize excellence wherever we find it and to praise it and, and savor it and, and call it for what it is. And if it isn't as thrilling as the next guy or not as exciting or not as, as whacked out, well, doesn't make it less excellent for that. It may not be to your taste, but that's another issue, isn't it? Number four, Herbert Cagle. Herbert Cagle was a very, very interesting case because, you know, this is, he's the first in a group of conductors, I'm going to mention, who sort of belonged together because they were contemporary music specialists, first of all. And contemporary music, generally speaking, whether it was neoclassical or expressionistic or whatever it is, doesn't allow the kind of interpretive latitude, normally speaking anyway, then the, uh, that we look for look for in like you know late romantic stuff and even from beethoven on really that kind of stuff that kind of that kind of freedom and excitement and you don't usually get that in contemporary music and because you don't the qualities that the music requires are those of clarity precision fidelity to the score these are not things that are going to change tremendously whether something is live or whether it's a studio recording you can do those things either way, fairly simply. So unlike someone like Ormandy, who again, I think deserves more credit because of what he really did in that repertoire, 
you know, Cagle's repertoire, by and large, was was of a type that you know, like I said, that had had a much a much easier route in comparing between studio and live performance. There should have been less difference in it. And of course, again, there's nothing wrong with that at all. And I just think there is. I think he was a wonderful conductor, but one of, you know, great sort of precision and and clarity and and you know, that was his thing. And so and so he wasn't he wasn't studio bound or concert bound. It was the same in either location. But for whatever reason it was. The next one is totally the opposite of Kegel, but he had the same qualities, and that's Eugen Jochum. Now, Jochum was like Fort Wengler with talent. And what I mean by that is he had the reliability, he had the technique, he had a lot of the same, the same kind of impulsive, freewheeling nature in his music making. And you hear that very clearly on his recordings. But he was, he was a very, very talented conductor as a conductor. And so what you heard live and what you heard in the studio were extremely similar. And I can't say with Joachim that his, his studio stuff was, was any more specifically um, limited in any way as compared to his live stuff. It was all exciting. It was all incredibly musical. It was just marvelous. He was comfortable in both places. And also, I, I sometimes think it's because of his, you know, his belief in what he was doing. You know, there was always a certain sort of spiritual quality to Jochum. I mean, Blomstedt is like that too. It's not going to matter where he makes music. His religion was music. And, and wherever he espoused it, he was going to give it the same energy and effort and get the same results. And there's some conductors for whom that simply isn't true. Absolutely not. So another one who's just fabulous in the studio, and you know this because we were just talking about him, was Leonard Slatkin. Leonard Slatkin, or is Leonard Slatkin, because he's still with us, thank God. Leonard Slatkin can do anything anywhere. It's that simple. He's similar to a conductor he admires in that respect, which was Eugene Ormandy. Some people think Slatkin is like not the most exciting thing on wheels. Um, I think that that's actually rather unfair because a lot of his performances are hugely exciting. It's just that people don't credit him for the exciting repertoire that he does. They think he should, he should be more exciting in the repertoire he doesn't do, like, you know, Beethoven symphonies and stuff like that, or he's not known for. But in his Fach, he's thrilling, and it doesn't make any difference whether he's making a recording or whether he's in the studio. He will give the same effort, and nine times out of ten, he will get the same results. Now, another conductor in the Herbert Kegel mode was Esapekka Salonen. See, another modernist and someone who's a composer and someone whose values were, were precision and clarity and rhythm and, you know, those particular things and the emphasis on contemporary music. And that allowed him to get absolutely superb results at the studio, as well as live in concert. In fact, you know, those LPO Salonen recordings, most of those that I've heard, he was actually better in the studio than he was live in some of that stuff. He really was, because sometimes it was just very complicated music and it benefited from the ability to redo things or to, you know, make sure that you know, do a little judicious mixing and fixing if that was necessary. But in other circumstances, I just think, I just think he was, he was completely comfortable. He was just at ease in front of the microphones. And that's probably true of a lot of contemporary conductors. Um, I, I mean, contemporary meaning young and, and up and coming. You know, they, they're used to recordings. They expect them. And so it's not a question that they're going to do them very well. But here's a very, another very interesting case because it's an old guy. George Sell. George Sell was great in front of the microphones because he just would not let his orchestra play a single note that fell below the standard that he set. And that was true of everything. He was famous that way. When he, when he had guest conductors, he would lecture the orchestra and say, okay, guys, behave. You're not going to embarrass me. I don't care if he's the biggest jackass in the world. You are going to play as the Cleveland Orchestra that I trained you to be or God help you. That was Zell. And so it didn't matter what he was doing. He was going to get the best possible results out of, out of his players, and he trained them to agree with him. That's really the key. I mean, because after all, what the conductor wants doesn't matter if the orchestra doesn't care. 
But in, in Zell's case, he instilled a corporate pride and identity in those players that, that surfaced in every possible circumstance. And so he was an absolutely great recording artist. A conductor at the entire opposite end of the spectrum in some ways from Sell was, of course, we have to talk about him, Leopold Stokowski, the quintessential recording artist. He believed that records were their own viable medium of expression, and he was going to use every technical, technical device, whether it was phase four recording or manipulation of things or reorchestration or cuts or whatever, to, to get exactly the sound that he wanted one way or another. And he was obviously a genius um, at conducting in front of the microphones and a genius not in front of the microphones. But what's so fascinating with Stokowski is the extent to which his non-microphone performances sound like his gimmicked up microphone ones. Because it's really rather amazing how he could make an orchestra sound as, as sumptuous and rich and colorful as his recordings do, which are obviously heavily technically um, manipulated. But that's what geniuses do. And he was definitely one of them. He was the ultimate chord guy. Every single sound mattered. And again, he didn't care whether, I think he even loved being in front of the microphones. He truly did. He loved trying to see what he could do to the music to make it even more vivid and powerful than, you know, the quotidian mishaps and things that happened in front of a live orchestra. So Stokowski is like, has to be on any list. Then we have another one who's sort of, you know, and I find an odd case, Claudio Abbado. Now Abbado, Abbado's record, Abbado is another conductor whose recordings actually sound a lot better than his live performances did quite often. Not always, but quite often. I particularly find his Lucerne performances at the end of his life, the live things, to be, you know, really, really inferior to the work he did in the studio and the same music, as often as not. Again, there may be an exception here or there, but basically speaking, basically, he was such a micromanager, in my view, that whether he was live or whether he was in the, in the studio made very, very little difference. I think he was actually more comfortable in the studio because he was more in control. And that control was essential to his identity as, as a conductor. I think he actually was able to relax a little bit more knowing that he was in control and that he could fix things or redo things rather than a live performance where, where I, I mean, the ones I, I saw of him and I saw maybe a dozen or so um, were, were often very disappointing. They really were. And I, I, it surprised me because of course I'd heard his recordings which sounded marvelous. And so, you know, there you go. Another one. Oh, this is so much fun, isn't it? Isn't it interesting? Here's another one of the composer modern music guys who really shows you what they could do. Jean Martinon. Martinon, I, I think, is, was one of the, the great composer conductors because he was a composer. He was a composer of considerable substance and, and a modern music guy. And he had the composer's perspective on the music he did. And the composer's perspective tends to be, as we've seen with Cagle and with some of these other guys, somewhat objective and focused on qualities which, which obtain no matter where you are. And they don't rely on, on in, impulse or inspiration of the moment. They are things that you train the orchestra to do and you always do it that way. And that was, that was Martinol as well. I mean, he was just a tremendous conductor. The key, of course, with conductors like that is that they train the orchestra to do what the music wants so that, so that the performance is just marvelous for whatever reason. You know, if he's doing Nielsen 4 or gosh knows or Mahler 3, which is a live one, you know, he just, he just had a composer's eye for realizing what the demands of the score were. And he would do that no matter where he was because his his thing, like these other conductors, was not the fact that there was or was not an audience. It was the score. It was the thing in front of him, which had to be done a certain way. And so realizing all of that information was all he needed to ignite a fabulous performance. So after marching on, here's a really quirky one that I just love, Harnoncourt. Now, you know, and I know, that the period instrument movement is essentially the product of recordings. 
It really is. Because if you've ever heard any of these ensembles live, you would be amazed how little they sound like their recordings. The recordings are big and bold and upfront and gutsy because they've got a microphone in front of every instrument and they make these teeny, 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 tiny little ensembles sound like, ah, like this. But then you go hear them live and oh my goodness, you know, the harpsichord sounds like it's in another room and the violins, you know, the ones without vibrato, you realize there are only three of them and you can barely hear them. And, you know, things could be slightly out of tune here and there. I mean, I just remember going to, to Carnegie Hall to see, to see um, you know, period, some period instrument groups at Wild Recital Hall or in the new, the new hall, you know, um, what's the one, Sankel or whatever it's called, the one under, in the bottom, in the subway where the theater used to be. Yeah, I think that's what it's called. Something like that. Sankel or Frankel or Hankel or Spankel. I don't know. And and just how tiny, tiny, ineffectual these groups sounded when their recordings were so big and so vivid. Without the benefit of recordings, people like Pinnock and Hogwood and I, all those people, I mean, they would never have had careers. Never. Never in a million years. Not anything like what they were. That's for damn sure. So Harnacourt is definitely one of those guys. And he could be just as bizarre in the studio as he would be live. He made no differentiation either. And he was bizarre as often as not. So there you go. Now here's a conductor. He's sort of in the, the sleeper pile. Constantine Silvestri. Silvestri is one of those conductors who, what well, he's reminding me of, Shandor Vague was another one. Whose, whose musicality was so tremendous that it simply, it simply manifests in everything he did. Every time he touched something, it came out sounding like that. And it wouldn't have made any difference whether he was in the studio or whether he was live. And we have a lot of his live stuff. And it, it's all of a piece. It really is all of a piece. It's just terrific. And, and I think he's an example of truly a, a conductor slash genius who... Who, whose musicality was, was just all-encompassing. After Silvestri, there is good old Zubin Mehta. We've been, you know, one of the happiest things, actually, in all of these talks about conductors and artists has been the, the enthusiasm with which you all have accepted the mastery of Zubin Mehta, especially his Los Angeles recordings in that Decca box. Because although he's had his ups and downs, he is a splendid conductor, and he has no problems at all in front of the microphones. He can make thrilling, thrilling records that lose absolutely nothing in translation. And I think he deserves credit for that. I really, really do. That L.A. box has got some of the finest orchestral playing and recording. This side or that side of the 20th century, wherever we are. And, and he's just done wonderful, wonderful stuff. And I really think Decca needs to finish up his stuff and do all of his Vienna recordings as well. Um, and, you know, and all the other things that were not either L.A. or, or New York or whatever it is. They should just, just, just get, get the rest of it out there because there's some amazing stuff. He was, he is a, a very, very talented conductor and, and he has no problem, no problem working in front of the microphones. I often wonder sometimes, too. He was like Ormandy. He's a very good accompanist. You know, he, made, he, was, he was one of the sort of, you know, the go, I mean, he did the three tenors, the go-to guy when you needed a really solid accompanist. And maybe that had something to do with it. I don't know. There's a groundedness to his conducting that I think is, is always present. And if it isn't going to be good live, it's not going to be good in the studio. And if it's terrific live, it's going to be just as terrific in the studio. You don't have to worry about it. And now we come to like the ultimate composer, conductor, modern music guy. Of course, it's Pierre Boulez. I don't think Pierre Boulez gave a damn whether there was an audience or not an audience. And whether there was, it didn't matter because he was so cold and so completely, completely icily, loftily focused on whatever he was doing that he did it no matter what. And that was that. There wasn't going to be any difference. I mean, it is kind of fascinating. There are some conductors who are completely glacial in the presence of an audience. And that was Boulez. It wouldn't make any difference whether there was a person there or a person not, not there, whether they clapped, whether they didn't clap, whether they liked it. And I think, frankly, his attitude 
as a composer. His sort of standoffish, elitist, you know, audiences are sort of stupid morons anyway, and they're not going to get what I'm doing, and, and, and it doesn't make any difference whether they like it or not. I mean, all of those attitudes are going to insulate you against the need to be spontaneously responsive to an audience situation. And I think that's really what it was with him. I think he just believed in himself. And so his music making was a form of, of self-communion, if you want to put it flatteringly. And, uh, and, and it didn't make any difference whether he was in the studio or not in the studio. None at all. In fact, he was probably better in the studio, too. All, all in all. I mean, after all the years I heard him, um, you, you know, he was a very, very capable conductor. He became one anyway. He grew into it. And and it was was completely businesslike in his approach to things, and you know if the if the orchestra was with him then it was fine if they weren't it was a mess <laughs> that was that, but his studio stuff for the most part except for that god awful Stravinsky Symphony of Psalms and other stuff on Deutsche Grammophon, but by and large his studio stuff is completely representative of his live stuff, and uh, you know we have like some. Examples of that in tapes and things. Let me move this up here. I'm, I'm getting toward the end here. I'm on the last five. He was number 15. So, John Elliott Gardner. John Elliott Gardner combines the opportunistic, timbral, colorful, sort of show offedness of the period instrument movement with the completely standoffish frigidity of Pierre Boulez. And as a result, be, you know, Gardner is another one who doesn't give a damn about the audience. He doesn't care if they're there or if they're not there. He's doing it because it's what he wants to do, and the rest of the world be damned. I think that's just his attitude. And so as a result, he is just as at home in the studio as any human being ever can be, because he doesn't really care about human beings. And I say this, you know, I'm being facetious, of course, but it, there, there is a, a nugget of truth in all of this. Because what all of these comfortable studio people have in common is the, is the belief that the music itself is all that they need to get excited. It's not about extraneous factors. And it doesn't matter whether you, you know, the extraneous factor is like, because I hate people, I'm a misanthrope and I hate audiences and I'm emotionally frigid or anything like that. It's just that the music itself is sufficient. And Gardner is that kind of an artist. I don't like everything he's done, but whether I like it or not isn't the point. The point is how well he does it under different circumstances. And he's done some very, very great stuff. He really has. That suits him. And certainly the fact that he might have been in the recording studio did not make any difference. So after Gardner, we're going to jump way, way back to a fascinating conductor I just spoke a bit about, and that's Bruno Walter. Now, Walter was not a perfect recording artist. You know, we have plenty of live stuff from him, and we do know that when he was live, he would let his hair down more than he would in the studio. But in a way, it's not entirely fair, because if you listen to the Walter box, you find that his earlier stuff is much more like that, much more impulsive, whereas his later stuff, he was older. He was very old, and he was more frail, and so he slowed down. And his, and his interpretive preferences changed, too. I don't think you just, just chalk it up to age in a, in a negative sense. I think that, that there were certain things that he listened for and enjoyed doing later in his life. But the interesting thing about Bruno Walter is that he really was one of the oldest conductors we have, along with Toscanini, to really understand and take advantage of the value of recordings. And that was a huge paradigm shift in the way conductors operated. Because in order for you know, recordings to make their impression, conductors had to believe in them and believe in what they were and believe in their potential. And once the sonics got good enough to somehow approximate what these people heard when they conducted live, they, they no longer had an excuse to disdain technology, but rather to see it as a tool, a tool to preserve, of course, great music and their individual interpretations, but also to teach others and bring you know a whole new audience into the universe for it. I mean, there was no limit to the possibilities. And Bruno Walter was one of the first to realize that, even more than Toscanini did. He understood the value of recordings. 
And I also think because his reputation was of, you know, such a, a, a an all around sort of cultured European nice guy, even if he wasn't always that way. I mean, I know, but, you know, his reputation was that uh, he humanized the, the technology for a lot of people who might otherwise have looked askance at it or have been impatient with it because it was the quantity of stuff that Bruno Walter recorded in addition to the quality, which was really so extraordinary. So after Bruno Walter, we have to mention Nimi Yarvi because Nimi Yarvi was the guy who spent most of his career recording unusual repertoire. In other words, allowing us to hear music that we would never otherwise have an opportunity to see live. So for Yarvi, making a recording was, was, was even more important than a live performance, as often as not. He might never say that because, you know, there's this conspiracy, this conspiracy of thieves in the classical music performing world. One must never, never, you know, pr uh, uh, you know signal a preference for the cold, unfeeling, technological alienosity of, you know, recordings over live, warm, human music making. Oh, no. Well, maybe that's maybe that's true. But I got a, f a feeling that Yarvi understood perfectly well that what he was doing was absolutely invaluable in exposing people to all kinds of music they wouldn't otherwise hear. And the only way to do that was through the medium of recordings, and he exploited it superbly. And so there is no question that he understood that these recordings had to make the best possible case for the music he was conducting. And more often than not, they did. And after Yarvi, there is good old Fritzy, Fritz Reiner. Reiner is an interesting case because he has sort of the, the precision fetish of the composer conductors, but he applied it to not contemporary music primarily, to the romantic classics and, you know, from Beethoven on, the 19th century standards. But he brought to those that same kind of, that same kind of pinpoint accuracy and precision and that made some people find him to be quite cold and lizard-like, which I confess sometimes I do. It depends on the piece. But as often as not, absolutely thrilling and performing the music at a hitherto unparalleled standard, especially music that, that everybody slobbered over, like Richard Strauss particularly, you know, who Reiner is most famous for. You know, music that, that can, well, even Strauss called it, you know, his all fresco technique of scoring where, you know, you could drop notes, you can miss things, you can smudge rhythms. It's, it's not going to make any difference because there's so much going on all, all the time that it's not going to matter. But Reiner understood and used recordings as a medium to make the musicians really play it and play it at tempo, not slow. And that was Reiner's gift. He was every bit as powerful and compelling in the studio as he ever was live. And I think he was another one of those conductors who was even happier in the studio because he was a, a demonic control freak. And it gave him an opportunity to control. And last, but by no means least, there is that student of Fritz Reiner, Leonard Bernstein. Now, why, what I find interesting about Bernstein is that, of course, in the second half of his career um, with Deutsche Grammophon, he started releasing only live performances, but they were entirely live because they were edited from, from rehearsals or multiple performances to create one ideal performances, but they were live. And whether or not we believed that the fact that they were live made them more impulsive or somehow more exciting than had they been solo studio, solely studio efforts, um, I don't think, I don't believe that. I don't accept it because the evidence of my ears does not accept it. You know, Bernstein's Sony recordings, his CBS stuff, which was which were mostly studio recordings, are by and large far more exciting and spontaneous than his later live DG remakes. So Bernstein, I think, is the exception that proves the rule. There is no guarantee, that, and not that, it, by the way, that the DG stuff, some of it wasn't just fabulous. It was. Don't get me wrong. I mean, some of it was just amazing. But there was no way... No way at all to be able that you could assert hearing this body of work that the live stuff was somehow more immediate or more exciting or more anything than the studio stuff because it just wasn't. 
It simply wasn't true. Does that mean that Bernstein was happier in the studio? Hell no. Nobody thrived on audience response more than Bernstein did. My goodness, he just wanted the crowd. He was a showman. So he loved being in front of an audience. There's no question it got him jazzed up. But again, I think at the end of the day, um, it was it was the the music itself that got him jazzed up more than more than almost anything else. And so and so let me see. Is that it? That's the whole crew. Yes, that's the whole crew. That is 20 conductors. Oh, my goodness. 20 conductors, all of whom were at least as good in the studio as they were live. And there are many more. There are many more. You want to do 21? Let's talk Charles McCarris, one of the greatest conductors of the 20th century. He never made a bad record in his life and never gave a bad performance of anything in his life because he was simply so on top of the musical facts. At the end of the day, my conclusion out of this entire exercise is, is just that that what really matters, frankly, is is whether or not a, a conductor's response to the music, their musicality, their their own personal, you know, view of a work manifests itself under all circumstances. The best conductors, it does. It really does. And it should, because like I said, it's their job. It's post ab but they are never supposed to not manifest. Of course, everyone has off days. I understand. But you know what I mean. You know what I mean. If they're going to participate in this particular line of work, in this particular culture, which involves both live things and studio things, then you have to be equally good at both or something is simply not right with your ability to do your job correctly. Now, today, where we have YouTube and we have, you know, everything can be recorded live and everything is being recorded live and, can, and it can be done in very, very fine sound. And orchestras are so good that they seldom make mistakes. And so you don't really need to fix things as often. All of this live versus studio stuff may be, may be changing. It may be less important, less significant than it is. And I do think that when we have these discussions about sort of live versus studio, I, to me, they sound somewhat anachronistic, particularly in, in today's culture. You know, I mean, because it's, nobody cares really anymore. I, I, I really don't think they do. I, I, and I, I think they're right not to, by the way. I really do. So, uh, but I did want to do this before it becomes completely irrelevant just so we could talk about some of the great names and raise the issue. Um, is it live or is it Memorex? You know, remember that? Remember that ad? Is it a tape or is it the live thing? Can you tell the difference? Interpretively, obviously, we can all tell the difference sonically, despite what Memorex may have said or how many billions we want to spend on, on equipment. Um, and uh, I, I just think it's very interesting. I think that these conductors deserve credit for being able to do both things equally well, and we should be able to distinguish between those who do and those who don't. So keep on listening, folks. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope this has given you some food for thought. I certainly did me, as you can probably tell from the length of this chat, this little chat. Take care.